All right, here we go. <clears throat> and welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. It's a pretty interesting show today. Lots of, uh, I, I think, disconnected stories to talk about. And to talk about those disconnected stories um, are my friend, Mr. Doug Kay and Mr. Don Komarechka. Hey, guys. Hey, Hello, Frederick. Frederick. It's gonna, like I said, this is gonna be a good show. So we're gonna dive right into that. But before we do it, I want to thank our first sponsor for this episode of this week in photo, and that's our good friends over at FreshBooks.com. All right. So story number one: Apple in the news again with some new fangled hardware or something. I don't know. Anyway, so Apple announced a new MacBook featuring the new USB Type-C port. So I want to talk about that a little bit, only because I know lots of people are going to rush out and buy this thing. I'm not going to rush out and buy it, because I uh, spent all my money on this new iMac that I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, I want to talk, specifically, I want to talk about this Type-C port and the, and, and the impact of it on photographers. Don Komarechka, I know you're not a Mac user. It's okay, we forgive you for that. Uh, <laughs> but... but with this, I know you're familiar with the Type C port because you are the type of person that knows all about the Type C port and uh, and these kinds of innovations. Is this just change for change's sake, adding a new USB plug to the already crowded plug line that we have to choose from? Well, I'm glad they finally got one thing right with this, Frederick, in that you can plug it in uh, either direction, upside down, upside right, and it's going to work. I mean, Apple's done this for a while. Now, finally, USB has caught on. Uh, but you know, the funny thing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the only uh, connective port on the Mac at all. You plug in your power through this. You plug in your peripherals through this. And there is a headphone jack. But mm -hmm. beyond that, you can't, you can't plug in any peripherals and charge the, the MacBook at the same time? Is, is that right? Um, I, I haven't played with it yet, but from what I've read, in knowing Apple, they'll have adapters for that. So you'll be able okay, to... So I'm sure it'll be like a breakout cable. This. Like the kind of the, you know, I call it a kludge, what they did when they were transitioning from DisplayPort over to Thunderbolt. You had this the display I'm actually looking at right now. <laughs> you have this display that has this hybrid plug on the end of it that can do all these different things. I assume, And then, you know, Apple charges you $29 for every little adapter you buy. So I'm sure there'll be a transition, a profitable transition point for them. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, what do you... Overall, well, tell us what it does. Do you know what this... What Other yeah. than being bi-directional and all that, what's, what's the good thing about this port? So yeah, it, it supports the USB 3.1 standard, which uh, a lot of PC enthusiasts have been clamoring about over the last little while, because it basically doubles the throughput speed of USB 3, and so that improves the the amount of data that you can you know run through just about any peripheral that you're trying to connect in. Um, you know, portable SSDs that are now like external storage devices are becoming more and more common, and some yeah. of those will hit the market that will give you blazing fast speed to and from any photo library that you have uh, you know that you have with you as a photographer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, I was reading as I was preparing for the show. I was sort of reading up on the on the the different uh, what do you call it? The outcry, Doug. And I want to have you chime in on this. The outcry from people. You hear this on all about the gear all the time about pe about manufacturers changing for change's sake and why are doing this and Apple's just changing again. You know, what do you what do you think? Is it is it a valid argument that Apple is making these changes for change's sake, or do we really need USB C? Well, you know, I, you and I bought our new 5K IMAX on the same day, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I waited for it because I wanted Thunderbolt, so now they're taking away Thunderbolt. <laughs> it's not you know? gone yet. It's not gone yet. Yeah, well, no, but it's not on this gadget, you know. Yeah. And so there are a couple of interesting things. By the way, you mentioned a 19 or $29 adapter. Well, the adapter from Apple is $79. It's $79. $79. And what this oh. is is it's got the USB-C on one end, and then it fans out into one HDMI port, which, by the way, only does 1080p, won't do 4K. Mm. It's got a USB 3 connector, and then it's got another USB-C connector, so you can sort of daisy chain them. You can put the, you can put your power into this thing. So, so for anything realistic, I assume this thing doesn't have an SD card. I don't know SD. No, cards, I didn't see that on there. I, that was know. the first thing I looked for was an SD port. You know, I've I've gotten to the point where if I don't have an SD card slot on a machine, I don't want it. You know, I'm right. just sort of I, I don't want to carry a card reader around. So now you got to carry a card reader. You got to carry this seventy nine dollar adapter, 
if you want to be able to plug your your computer in while you're reading the SD card. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm I'm you know I'm concerned because this is not a very high performance uh, interface. It is not as fast as Thunderbolt 2, and as we know, uh, Thunderbolt 2 is pretty important if you're going to have external drives. This is only a 10 gigabit per second interface. Thunderbolt 2 is 20. Uh, this will support 4K monitors, but it's not going to support uh, 5K monitors. It's not fast enough. So, um, I don't know. You know, there must the, you can bet there were a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, and they're doing it for some good reason that we don't understand. But um, at this point, my my guess is that they just couldn't. Intel and Apple couldn't get the uptake on Thunderbolt that they wanted to have. Is my I opinion. hope not, because it, it feels like we just got Thunderbolt. <laughs> it's like we I just know. got it, just got here, and we're just now seeing drive manufacturers start to incorporate the Thunderbolt standard into their units, and now it's time for it to go away again. I, I mean. If if that's the case, technology is just moving too fast. I mean, we just we don't have time for anything to catch root before we get a new one. So that's, that's my the, opinion. Go ahead. One other thing about this, Don mentioned that you could turn the connector upside down, but you can also use either end. Yeah. Um, it both ends are identical. So, which is great because I thought the USB connector was sort of stupid. The original ones were so big, given the amount of current that they carry and the fact that they're only four contacts, they're just monstrous things. Yeah. So I'm glad they're going to smaller either end of the cable, upside down or backwards. Um, and what's interesting is it's got bi-directional power. So you yeah. can power your laptop, but you can also charge your phone from the laptop. Or, right. or and if I read this correctly, or if you're, say you're on a plane and your computer's dying, but you have a full charge on your iPad, you could theoretically plug your iPad into your computer and suck the charge from the iPad into the computer. I'm going to get a headache. Uh, just I, I don't know. Which direction would it go, though? Because, you know, it, it's going to have one preference to, to put power in one direction. How do you tell it which way to go? I wonder I'm if sure it, all I, I have no idea, but, but I'm wondering if, it, if it's smart enough, it might say, hey, you know, there's this much juice over here and this much over here. Who do you want to get what? You know, that would be cool if you could do that. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, but you look at this stuff, and I, you know, I, I start seeing patterns in the chaos, you know, like over time, because we had, you, you guys remember, we had similar arguments when we went from what was it, uh, iSCSI? Doug, you, remember, you guys remember yeah. iSCSI? We went from <laughs> yes. iSCSI uh, on the Apple side, it was iSCSI and daisy chaining with terminators and all that. To Apple, then came up with the, I don't know if it was right after that, but the Display Port. Remember DisplayPort adapters and all that? And these was all proprietary things that, that only Apple made. And then it went to, you know, on the iPhone, it went to, you get the uh, the uh, connector. What is the uh, the Apple DisplayPort? What's the display connector on the on the old iPads or the I, old iPhones? Whatever that first plug was, the connector port on the first phones, we got those. And then we went to this lightning connector and now we're looking at this which is presumably going to be on everything going forward so don't get me don't get me started on uh, parallel interfaces and punch cards yes <laughs> well, I don't, that was before <laughs> before my time man. I'm, I'm happy to say i'd never ever touched a punch card in my <laughs> life so i don't know Don Komoretska, do you even know what a punch card is come on i know what a punch card is yes i've seen them in museums in museums thank you <laughs> I think the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose has a couple of stacks of those done. <laughs> but, but you know what's interesting, Frederick, is when we get into the idea of sort of interface standardization, you know, we've, we're in sort of a, a time of flux in sort of uh, PC and, and Mac interfaces with Thunderbolt and USB and all these different interfaces being thrown about. We had that in the photography industry, too. If anybody remembers, uh, Olympus had their XD cards. There was smart media cards that were a yeah. previous incantation to that that were like wafer-thin things that would crack. And So we evolved and we standardized. We standardized around SD and Compact Flash. Each of those standards are ancient uh, you know, in comparison to what we've got now, but they still keep up. It's the same cards. It's the same interface. Everything runs through exactly the same thing. And what do we have as an end result is, you know, any SD card fits in anything, right? So yeah. I'm happy with that. Why can't we have something similar in photography? I know. In, I, in, I love in, that. All, all these other devices, yeah. I love that because, I, you know, on, on my Android devices, I have a couple of Android devices, and I love the fact that I can just use my one single kind of USB plug to charge all my Android devices and a couple of my cameras and other devices all use the same little port. Even the Kindle 
uses the same USB connector as everything. Then on the Apple side, there's, you know, it, it spreads out a little bit, you know? I would like the Android, the the Windows PC, the Chromebook, and the Mac OS crowd, and the iOS crowd, all to use the same single connector. Wouldn't that be great if it was all one bi-directional reversible connector that would, you know, one connector to serve them all? We would decimate an entire cable industry, but <laughs> it would be awesome just to have one cable, you know? I don't know. Think we'll ever get there done? I, I hope so, but there's licensing fees at play here, right? So yeah. if the manufacturers yeah. don't want to pay the licensing fees to jump on board for Thunderbolt because the USB 3 licensing fees are cheaper, then the manufacturers are looking at their bottom dollar and figuring out which direction to go. It might be something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's really hard to say, but I'm, to be honest, I'm disappointed that there's only one. It looks like within that machine that there's room for two, mm -hmm. and you know, to, you can charge it, and you can play other, uh, plug in other devices without having a series of dongles and other connectors. And by the time you add everything that you need to make it fully functional uh, for a creative person, the slim, beautiful design of that uh, of that MacBook is gone, right? Because yeah. now you're carrying around all of this extra clutter just to make it useful for you. Yeah, now you're now you're flying around like a Borg ship with a bunch of different races tacked onto you. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm totally geeking out. Star Trek. So <laughs> Doug, Doug, okay, Doug. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the minimalism of this thing. So Don brought it up, the fact, you know, there's one port, two ports if you count the headphone jack, but one, one I.O. port on this thing for power, one port to rule them all. This thing is super slim. It's lighter yet again than previous editions. Got a retina display on it and a force touch feedback keyboard that, that it's pressure sensitive and, and that sort of thing. Now, is... Well, first of all, I know you're probably not going to buy this from what you said at the beginning, but when you look at this, is Apple going too far with the minimalism stuff? I mean, like Don said, we're, we get the minimalistic sort of svelte computer with a bunch of stuff hanging off of it because we still have work to do. I mean, is are we, a, are we ahead of the game? Is Apple ahead of the game, or are they pushing it too far? Oh, no. I mean, this is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, this particular machine isn't one I think that most photographers would want because it's not particularly fast um, uh, but it's you know it's got some really cool technology as Apple always does in there I think it's it is um, you know when they came out with the MacBook Air if you remember when that was first announced that was sort of an experiment I don't think they uh, thought that would sell particularly well or they didn't certainly position it like it would and that thing took off and they came out with subsequent models so who knows where it's all gonna go um, but this is a pretty nice looking machine, just not one I think that most photographers would go for. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of that one port thing because <laughs> I'm afraid of the one, the one port and I'm afraid of the, um, the, uh, the lack of SD card slot on there because I, I need both of those things. You know, it's like when I'm out and about, I, don't, I mean, I guess you could bring a portable SD card reader, but then you're going to plug it into that one port. <laughs> hey, just, just remember, in 10 years... We're going to be doing this show, and then we'll all have gray hair. I won't be the only one. And we'll be saying, hey, remember when we had cables? Oh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> remember remember, in, when, in remember years, when we had, to, we had to plug stuff in? In wow. 10 years, Doug, I plan to be sitting on my front, front porch. I'm going to be like Morgan Freeman, man. I'm sitting there fishing, just like telling stories to my grandkids. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next story, number two. Um so Google is uh, cranking up the, the pressure in the cloud storage space. Let me read this. So, so Google says the amount of data being produced around the world is staggering and continues to grow at an exponential rate. Given this growing volume of data, it's critical that you store it in the right way, keeping frequently accessed data easily accessible, keeping cold data when available when needed, and being able to move easily between the two. Organizations can no longer afford to throw away or throw data away, as it is critical, conducting analysis and gaining market intelligence, but they also can't afford to overpay for growing volumes of storage. So today they are, Google, we are excited to introduce Google Cloud Storage Nearline, a simple, low-cost, fast response storage service with quick data backup, retrieval, and access. So, and I'm not going to read the rest of this, but when I, I, I know you guys have looked at this. Don Komarechka, this might, we did a show, you remember a while back we did a show on data storage solutions for oh, yeah. photographers? 
is this that, that ultimate ball never ends? <laughs> I know it never ends. Is this is this that ultimate solution that okay we we want it we want a a pool of data that's instantly accessible and then we when it's old it can go into cold storage but we still want to be able to get to it. Sounds like this is what Google's doing. What do you think? I I, I love this this idea because you know if I have to wait a few seconds or heck even a few hours to recover old data I don't mind doing that because if I'm uh, like right now I'm in the process of trying to upload my entire archive of information onto the cloud. Some stuff that I might not touch again for many years or might never touch again but I just have it all here I want it up in the cloud and how am I going to do that and, yeah. and so I don't need it. Like, if if I need access to it, it's probably because my local drives die, uh, and then I need some way to pull it back down as sort of a, a recovery method. And so, having the data not necessarily immediately accessible, but you know, with however much time it requires, I think it's a great business model. The issue is that Google, I think. Looking at this from a photographer's perspective, they're targeting uh, businesses and corporations and uh, application developers and, and that kind of stuff with regards to their pricing model. Because there's a lot of people out there right now that are offer unlimited pricing plans uh, for for data just to be th sort of thrown up in the cloud, but not necessarily as accessible based on different programming interfaces and available on the web and available uh, to uh, you know to a wider mass of people in the business space. So it's interesting to see that they're making waves, as Google always does. Uh, but uh, well, I'll, I'll let I guess Doug chime in because uh, I think he brought the story to our attention as to how this could relate to photographers, how it's our benefit. Yeah, I'm interested, Doug. I'm in thanks for bringing this to our attention. I'm I'm anxious to see what you think about this. I mean, is it the holy grail? When I when I read any kind of new storage story or storage play like this one, I instantly think, wow, that's great and awesome. Okay, now do, how do I get all this data off of my current local drives onto their cloud and I'm back in the same bucket again of it's going to take forever to get my data. What do you think, Doug? Yeah, I mean, it's the devil's in the details. So I think whenever people get excited about this, they have to take a step back and do some of the math. First of all, anytime you have off-site storage, you have to look at your own internet upload speed. Now, I have a very high speed connection. I've got 100 megabit per second down, 11 megabits per second up. And I can do uh, a gigabyte in 15 minutes, but it takes me to upload, it takes me two weeks to do one terabyte. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's 11 megabits, it takes me two weeks to do a terabyte. So everybody needs to think about it in terms of how many terabytes they have. Got one terabyte, it's going to take you two weeks to upload. You got four terabytes, it's going to take you eight weeks to upload that if you have my speed. So that's an important thing. And, but again, that's uploading all the time and assuming that you're not going to be using that bandwidth for, say, watching a movie or anything else. Well, I'm, right? talking about, I'm mostly talking about that initial upload. Right. 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 Getting the thing, the pump primed, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's something to consider. Now, you only have to suffer through that once, it's true. But then go look at the details. Amazon and Google are both charging one penny per gigabyte per month for storage. Same price it looks like, but um, Google charges a one cent per gigabyte retrieval fee. Uh, they charge an early deletion fee. So if you if you put a file up there and delete it in less than thirty days, they charge you for that too. That's new. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, if you but it's a different thing. If you look at uh, Glacier, which is the Amazon offering, uh, as Don pointed out, it might take a couple of hours to retrieve a file, but they charge you for the number of I/O requests. They charge you for the retrieval fee. It'll cost you ninety dollars to retrieve a terabyte from Amazon Glacier. Oh, geez. Okay. So uh, that's a terabyte. That's a lot of data. You know. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff in here. Um, you know, when we did that last show, I ended up writing a, a, a blog post on the TWIP blog, and I think we'll link to that from this show too so people can go back and see. I ended up with a what is admittedly a way too geeky solution, but I have off-site storage using my own hardware. I've been running now for about nine months, and it's, it's just working marvelously, but it's not for the, the faint of heart. I want to point out one other thing just for perspective that people don't consider. How about Dropbox? Dropbox is only nine ninety nine per terabyte per month, um, so it's the same price to use Dropbox. Dropbox is quite fast. Mm -hmm. Now, Dropbox used to use Amazon, so how do they pay a penny per gigabyte and charge a penny per gigabyte? Well, obviously, they're doing aggregation. They're not 
they're charging you you know a, for a larger quantity than you use it's like cell phone minutes yep. Um, yep but you know if you get an annual if you pay annual from Dropbox you get it cheaper you get a 17% discount the difference of course is they don't promise any redundancy they don't have a service level agreement that uh, that Glacier does so anyway like I say a lot of details to consider this is not a breakthrough Amazon's been doing this I've been using Amazon for about nine years for storage yep. it's very very reliable Google doesn't yet have the track record so uh, so boil all that down for us um, we, you mentioned Amazon you mentioned um, this new Google service and Dropbox and there's a bunch of author also rants <laughs> and a and a homebrew solution that you put together right you know that you're using you've been using for nine months for the folks that are just listening to this and your traffic on the way to work and they're like, okay, I want to check it out. Should I even bother? Should they bother? Should they, or, or should you know, they just keep you, working? You, you've got to have off-site storage of valuable files. You can't do them the Frederick way. I heard you on the last show talking about this. You want to have extra copies in the house. I'm telling <laughs> I you. I know I'm doing bad. I know. I'm, a, I'm aware of my shortcomings. Get Come on. stuff out of the house. And doing it online, if you, if you use an automated tool, um, any of these things can be automated. So you automatically, at least once a day, you've got your stuff offside. If you're very geeky, you can do it my way. Look at the article I wrote. Um, you can certainly use any of the products that use Amazon. The Google stuff is going to have third parties using Google. It's not as tried and true just for experience. Yeah. Uh, Dropbox is great for, I think, for a smaller quantity um, because Dropbox means you can get to it from everywhere. But um, well, whatever Doug, I you do, have, you got, I have, you got, a, I have a, a Mac Mini back there cranking away behind me that's set to upload to Backblaze every night at, I think it cranks up at midnight and it goes to like 7 a.m. Yeah, so, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be great if that was located at a friend's house at least 10 miles away? That would be great. You see, yep. and that would be great. that's the way to do it. I need a time machine, Don <laughs> Don Komarechka. Don, what about you? You you just quickly your your offsite backup solution. All right, so I'm in the process right now of uh, of uh, trying to use Carbonite to upload all of my data to the cloud, right? Because they've got an unlimited storage solution and it's a flat rate. So it's going to cost me about a hundred bucks a year in order to have as much data as I can throw to them online and in the cloud, and then retrieve it. Uh, you know, but by the same method. The issue for me, again, like Doug had mentioned, is that initial upload of trying to push it up into the cloud. And I discovered something that I didn't expect uh, when I started to do this process. You know, I, I fully expected it to take probably a couple of months, if not more, mm -hmm. uh, to push up, you know, eight or ten terabytes of data up to the cloud. And I've got a slightly faster connection than Doug. It's around 25 megabits per second upstream. So I figured, all right, you know, I've got at least enough, you know, bandwidth to to throw that stuff up there at a reasonable pace. Well. After about a day or so of, uh, of throwing data up, my bandwidth goes from about 25 down to 7. Reliably cut off at 7. And something, and okay, something in the mix is throttling the connection. I contact mm -hmm. Carbonite, and they flat out refuse that they're doing anything about it. And so, okay, then I contact my internet service provider here in Canada, Rogers, and they flat out refuse that they're doing anything to, to throttle the connection. And so, okay, somebody's doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I did a, 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 a sort of a trace route just to see exactly where my internet traffic is going through between where I am and Carbonite. It's going from my local internet service provider through some internet backbones directly to Carbonite. There's not a lot of mid middlemen in between. So I connected to a VPN. And so I connected my internet connection to a, uh, an encrypted tunnel in Toronto. It's about an hour away from here. Just yeah. to see if my internet service provider was, uh, you know, putting something in there. And my internet connection went up from the 7. Not to the full speed, mind you. But so, so now I'm, I'm battling, okay, I'm paying for a service to upload my data. And I don't know if it's the internet service provider or any of the other backbone operators, but somebody is throttling my internet connection. Mm. And it's only for Carbonite, by the way, because if I try to do like any speed tests or upload to my FTP, they're all perfectly fast and furious. So I'm left frustrated because, you know, it doesn't matter how fast my upstream bandwidth is, something along the way is going to be slowing it down. And I know I'm not the only one. I'm sure a lot of other people out there have seen similar frustrations in trying to push their data up to the cloud because yeah. everybody wants to make money on it. And when you're throwing up that much data, there's a good chance that they're all going to lose money on you. Yeah, so they're like, yeah, let's just cut this guy off. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate, and it's what well, kudos, kudos and hats off to you for uh, hacking your way through there. I mean, you're like you're like the Julian Assange of the uh, of the ph photographic <laughs> backup world. Right? Yeah, but we know what's happening. Although Don's in Canada, we know that what's happening is that the United States government is looking at all of his pictures. Yeah, and that's what's slowing <laughs> it down. Like, look at this one. This is so cool. <laughs> oh, if only. Oh, man, so many. You know, this the storage thing is getting. Doug, you got to solve this, man. You got to do something. There's like, I got, I got a there's so story. many options. There's, My, I mean, there's this now, and then there's, there's, uh, you know, the, the Apple Photos and that app, and their, their spider web that they're building, and then, you know, God, there's just so many different choices. I don't, I don't know what to do. My, My Leo, My Leo's out there. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, remember, My Leo still has the upload problem. Yeah, but we talked about that on a previous show. The, their their upload problem is not really an upload problem because they're not you're uploading, kind of, but it's actually doing a BitTorrent style peer to peer sync thing between your computers, which if is it's, if it's leaving your house, it's still limited to ten whatever your upload bandwidth is. Yeah, just because yeah. it's BitTorrent doesn't make it faster. Ugh. <sighs> You can't you can't beat the physics. Thanks for raining on my parade, man. Yeah, Come on. Yeah. Next thing you yeah, can tell me. My, so, my solution's been running 24 hours a day, seven days a week for nine months. I check every once in a while. My files are all there. The only problem is you need an IT department to set it up. Yeah. See, Don, you see what I get with Doug? See, <laughs> I, he rains on the parade. Like Next thing he's going to be telling me, the speed of light is constant and it can't be broken. Come on. You know? <laughs> the, the good news is that uh, the... The internet bandwidth is constantly improving. You know, there's a competitor that I was just looking at because I'm fed up with my ISP that's giving 175 megabits per second both ways for about the same price. So I'm switching. Uh, now, I'll probably have throttling issues and who knows what other headaches I'm going to encounter. But as services like Google Fiber and competitors to that start to roll out across the world, um, then these problems will slowly go away. They'll yeah. still be really hurting people in rural areas, but at least the, the urban landscape is getting much faster connections as time goes on. We might not have this same conversation in five years because the problem might just disappear on its own. Yeah. That's, um, that, that's a really good question, though, because at the same time that's happening, our sensors are getting larger, our images are getting larger, and we're going, anybody in the still photography business is now bringing in video. So is the rate of increase of bandwidth greater than the rate of increase of our file size? I think so. I think so. And I think that there, there will be sort of a, a limit. Uh, when we're looking at, say, 4K video right now is superseding the, the, the HD video, and that's going to be huge. But after that, I think that the increase might be somewhat smaller. And when I'm going from, like, my, my direct competition goes from 25 megabits per second all the way up to 175 in my local area. And so that is a huge wow. increase in speed increase uh, compared to the uh, resolution jumps that we're seeing in digital cameras, including video. And so if that's an indicator, and if all we're just waiting for is the infrastructure to be put in place to have these blazing speeds everywhere, well, then you know we're golden. We won't necessarily have that issue. But Doug raises a very good point. As time goes on, so too does our data requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and hopefully everything becomes cheaper in the long run. And the only reason why I'm having a problem now is because I didn't have an online solution five years ago. And so the initial hurdle of getting up to speed is what everybody's going to struggle with. As soon as they're up to speed, I think that all these problems also go away. Yeah. Yeah, we were just all born too early, I think, because all this cool stuff is happening. It'll all be ratified and awesome in like 15, 20 years, and 15, 20 years, I'm probably not going to care much. Doug, I know you're not going to care much either, right? <laughs> 15, I'll, be, I'll be sitting on your front porch. There you go. We'll sit on the front porch, and uh, you know, we'll have our driver taking us around to get our coffee, and you know, we're done. That's it. Right. Uh, crazy, crazy times, but it's fun. This is good stuff. All right, guys. Um, let's move on to story number three. This one's also interesting. I want to, before we do that, I want to thank our next sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that's our good friends over at Lynda.com. All right, guys. Story number three is about Meerkat, and Meerkat is a new app to uh, live stream video on Twitter. Hmm, maybe we'll be doing This Week in Photo on Twitter next. So let me uh, let me read this description. So this week at, at uh, South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, 
Uh, traditionally, it's been the, the event where some of the most the world's most popular apps like Twitter and Foursquare have started their rise of fame. This year, we're getting an app with a lot of social media buzz at the show, and it appears to be an app called, or it's a video streaming app called Meerkat. Now, this app allows you to stream video over Twitter. Videos can be scheduled or live streamed, and a notification is automatically sent out over Twitter, which is really, really cool. Uh, last week, reporters from BBC News used the app to live stream protests in Ferguson. According to Ben Rubin, the CEO and founder, quote, we want to become the primary outlet of user-generated live media, end quote. Uh, a quick note at the end of this, uh, just a few days after launching the app, Twitter has blocked access to its social graph, which means when new users come on board, they will no longer be automatically connected to the other people that are they're already following on Twitter. This comes not long after Twitter purchased a competing live streaming service called Periscope. Don, uh, I'm going to throw this at you first. Twitter evolving? Video on Twitter? Scheduled live video or scheduled or live video on Twitter? What could the world be coming to? Well, I mean, everybody's uh, you know shooting more and more video, like Doug had said earlier. And uh, you know, in in the era of um, citizen journalism, uh, in in many ways, this this is becoming quite valuable uh, for the world over. And you know, it, it's a social thing to do, right? Uh, so there's a big demand for it, and the demand is growing now. Uh, Meerkat piggybacked on Twitter's API, their interface. You log into their application using Twitter, uh, and up until a little while ago, you would use their social graph, which would import all of your uh, followers, and you'd see anybody that you were following that also was using the service so that it was very, very well connected. And Twitter uh, had promoted this particular usage, right? They had uh, uh, an initiative, a project called Fabric. And uh, and this was for you know to to entice uh, app designers and and uh, and I guess just in independent developers to use the Twitter platform. Of course, when one of them gets very successful and directly competes with something that Twitter wants to do, uh, you know they they bring the hammer down on them and and they sort of squash uh, a lot of their initiatives. But they've gained a lot of steam, and so I think that even if Twitter does their own thing, then they might still be able to survive and be some sort of direct competition. But either way, this is a new space. This yeah. is a new space for people to be sharing video content uh, and to do it live in pre-existing social networks instantly without having to, to do any setup work from any mobile device and hopefully with uh, a backbone that is strong enough to support the growing demands of, of such things. I personally don't use this sort of stuff though. It, it's not right in my wheelhouse, um, but I, I know uh, based on looking at the numbers and the traffic, uh, you know, from you know services like this, that they're just exploding with new users. Mm -hmm. uh, and and how fantastic is this? But the, the the downside is when you have a great initiative like this and you don't build the infrastructure yourself, then the infrastructure will find a way to monetize it without you. Yeah, Doug, is this is this the next volley in the video wars against kind of trying to unseat the king of the king of the heap YouTube? <laughs> you know, I avoid every new social network as much as I can. Um, <laughs> That's the curmudgeon in you talking, man. Yeah, Come on. Yeah, but you know, but being a good Twip co-host, when I saw this in the show notes, I had to check it out. You know, can't can't sit here and sound like an idiot. Yeah. So I went and I installed Meerkat on my iPhone. And I started to play with it. And I got to tell you, this is a great app. This is really fun. Yeah, and you never say that. No, this is this okay. was a kick. I, <laughs> I watched I watched all sorts of people doing strange things last night. Uh, let me let me tell you what this is for people who don't really follow it. So we all know about things like Ustream, where you can go and say, "All right, I'm I'm capturing something on video on my mobile device, and I'm going to stream it to the internet." Okay, that's the video part of this. Mm -hmm. But then we also know about the, the challenges. How do you let people know? How do you let your friends know that you've got something going on? How do you let strangers know that you might be interested? For example, let's say you're streaming a video and there, there's a hashtag for it uh, that would be appropriate. So you're streaming video, it's about you know your favorite band or something like that. What these guys have done at Meerkat is a really good job of integrating the video with the notification. So uh, you can go on there and you can just start streaming and people just start watching and it's just so seamless, it's so simple and it's fun. So uh, to get around the problem of Twitter 
closing down their social graph through this API, at least to Meerkat, uh, there are some third parties who have come along and basically replaced that functionality. Mm. So there are ways, when you get into this, you start finding there are ways to find out who's streaming on Meerkat. How do you find them? How do you go and watch them? And so you just go and you just start watching what people are streaming. It's really, really fun, and it's so easy to do, and that's why I like it. So is this, is this personal, and I haven't downloaded it yet, um, so you're way ahead of me in terms of being prepared for this week in photo. So the, is this the next step in personal broadcasting? Like every, if you have a phone or a smartphone of some sort, now you can just broadcast whenever you want, and all your friends and family can watch it, uh, or followers can watch what you're doing, and what's the duration of time that you can stream? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any limit. You take your phone, you start at the app, you push the button, and now you just walk around with your phone and you point it at what you want to point it out or you, you set it down on the table and the audio and the video are streaming and people can come in and watch it and that's it. And as far that's as I understand it, uh, cool. when uh, when you start the video, if, um, you know, of course, before uh, Twitter closed off their social graph, um, and you, once you have your established network of people that you're already following within that app, um, then whenever you start the video, their phone will show a notification, uh, a push notification right on the front of it to say, hey, uh, Doug started sharing this video. Do you want to uh, clue in? So it's not like you have to open up the app. It's not like you have to check your email. You've got the push notification, and it can't be any simpler, right? Exactly right. We, uh, you know, Last night when I was playing with it, I probably went and watched 20 different users you know, streaming video, and... Because of that, of course, it knew those 20 users, and now I started getting notifications anytime those people started to stream video again. So I went in and I turned off the notifications from the app because I don't know that I'm going to use it long term. But i got to say, again, it's fun, and part of it is the seamless integration that makes it so easy to use. It's, it's going to be popular. If it's not Meerkat, it's going to be Periscope or something like that. Well, you know, like when I talk to Trey Radcliffe, one of the things that he preaches all the time is when you see these new networks pop up like this, get on and maximize them. Get, not only just, just stake your claim for your name or your handle or whatever, but get on there and start be one of the early adopters and start building up your following on there. Yeah, the, the beauty of this is you're only using your Twitter ID. So you don't have to go register a new Don Kamareczka or uh, Frederick Van Johnson. You, know, you don't have to reserve the name. Your ID is already there. It's really nice. Very cool. I wonder if we could broadcast Twip that way. That'd be cool. The, the, don't don't think of it in terms of quality. <laughs> oh, <laughs> See, that's that's where you lost me at the queue right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll uh, take a look. So you're saying we're looking at a postage stamp size video here, or what? All I know is that uh, that everything I watched last night, the the sync between the audio and video was off by as much as one and a half seconds. I'd say. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to play with it. And again, it's early, right? So. Yep. All right, well, cool. Yeah, so listeners, check it out. Meerkat is uh, it's out there live. We'll link it, link to it in the uh, in the show notes for this episode. All right, guys, let's do the uh, the listener Q and A. And this week's question is from Gavin Beckford. He says, "Is there really a difference in raw file processing by the various software, or does the difference lie in the default settings upon import? For example, on import, raw files look better in some applications, but some argue that you can achieve the same look by tweaking default settings to your liking." Does your software or the defaults make a difference? Uh, Doug K, why don't you go first? What do you What do you think? Is a Is there magic inside the raw files that needs to get unlocked by a particular camera manufacturer's raw file decoding, or is it whatever? Well, there there are a couple of things. Um, I'm thinking now about Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. Mm -hmm. When you bring your raw file in, first of all, it's it's I think that it's using the JPEG preview that's in the raw file, and that's what you're looking at initially. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do have a profile. Now, if you uh, you can set it up so that it uses a profile for your camera in Lightroom. And my understanding is that those profiles are copies or approximations of the camera profile. So let's say you're shooting with a, uh, a Nikon D610 and you're bringing in raw files, but when you did it, you had the you had the thing set to black and white, let's say. Mm -hmm. so what happens is that it actually uses the black and white profile or the, you know, the camera vivid setting or something like that. Um, but you'll, you'll discover in Camera Raw and Lightroom that there are settings for what camera profile to use. And there are some generic ones and there are some that are camera manufacturer specific. So mm -hmm. those will make a huge difference in how your image initially looks. Um, mm -hmm. 
And, and so that's profile slash preset. Um, in terms of the different applications, the only ones I've used besides Camera Raw and Lightroom, um, I've used Capture One from Phase One. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice. And one of the reasons is that if you're a Sony user, you get that for free. There's oh. a free version of Capture One. Very nice. Um, people tell me who use it religiously that it can do things that Adobe can't do. Um, I've played with it enough that I know that the results can be very good, but I, I don't know that I've pressed it hard enough to know that I can actually do things that I couldn't do in Lightroom. Yeah. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on that, I think there, when, in the case of Adobe and Camera Raw, when they decode files, they actually have to deconstruct those files to build the raw processing, to build in that raw processing into that particular version of Camera Raw. So when a new camera comes out, like Doug, in your example, the Nikon D610, the, you know, depending on the camera manufacturer, they may or may not get the data to decode its raw files. So they have to figure it out and kind of reverse engineer it on the Adobe side. And, you know, of course, they have Adobe scientists and, and gnomes at work in there that are very smart and do it, do it, uh, do it justice and pull out all that data. But the other side of that coin is if... You know, say it's a you know some some weird camera, or even even a mainstream camera that has some s direct tie-in with the with the lens optics and the body, and there's some sort of nuance in there that always needs to be corrected. The the decoding software will know about those defects and well, can wanna, correct for say, them. One, one thing here. There's a difference between the camera profile and the lens profile. Those yeah. are those are separate. Yeah, so I think this uh, this question comes in from Gavin is specifically about the camera profile. About the camera, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. But even then, so if there's a camera and there's specific magic in there when that raw when that raw file is decoded from that particular body, sometimes that's locked into the manufacturer. I want the final word on this from Mr. Don Komarechka <laughs> because. Don, I know, has gotten into the DNA and the subpixel level on this question and can answer for us. Don Komarechka, what do you think? There, there's a lot of math that goes on uh, behind the scenes in uh -oh. uh, what's called demosaicing of, of a raw file. So You lost me uh, at math. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's, the, here's the idea. Uh, every camera's raw file, most of them, Fuji's known to do some other weird things, and Sigma's got some weird ideas about it. But they have what's uh, called a Bayer pattern uh, on top of the camera sensor because the camera actually collects just light. It doesn't collect, uh, and it doesn't recognize any colors. So there's a filter in front of the sensor that determines what colors are. And it's in a pattern of green, red, green, red, green, red, blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, ad nauseum. Uh, and so what a raw processor has to do is it has to take a four pixel grid of green, red, and then blue, green, or whichever order they happen to be in, and translate that into whatever resulting color in RGB should be there for one pixel. And then it moves over two pixels, and it translates that again to figure out another pixel value, and over two, and over two, and over two, does an entire row, and it goes down by two pixels and does the entire thing again. So you might see in some cases where a camera is listed as having, say, 22 megapixels, but maybe 21.1 effective megapixels, because mm -hmm. it's this demosaicing process from the raw data, which is just you know ones and zeros with this filter applied to create actual colors uh, that are you know usable to us as photographers, uh, and the math in doing that can be somewhat complex and every software is going to be able to, to, to work differently with it. Um, if you compare old software from say five, six years ago compared to what's out now, the software is better because the math is better, the processing algorithms are better because people have more powerful computers and sort of the scientists keep studying this sort of stuff. And it's not just the colors that you see, it's how you can process that data. For example, uh, DxO Optics has their prime noise reduction that only works on raw files and it yeah. works very, very well. Uh, dealing with the raw information to remove as much noise as possible. Uh, certain sharpening needs to be applied to a raw file as well because of this demosaicing process. Uh, if you'll notice, whenever you bring in an image into, uh, into Lightroom or Camera Raw, the sharpening is by default set to 25% because uh, you lose sharpness when you're doing this whole process, when you're splitting up the pixels in this way. Uh, and so different applications are going to apply sharpening based on different algorithms. There's a lot of stuff under the hood that will make different programs function differently uh, and they all have different scientists working for them and they have different math that most of it's proprietary 
Uh, they yeah. will talk to the camera manufacturers to figure out how to read the files, and oftentimes they're pretty transparent about it. Um, but their own particular flavor of what happens as a result uh, make, makes pretty much every raw processor its own unique entity. So bottom line, it sounds like if, if I grok all of what we're, all three of us is saying, um, go with the raw processing decoder of choice and tweak it to your liking because each one of them, like Don is saying, each one of them is going to be using a, a, its own variety of math to decode that file. But in the end, they'll probably all end up at the same general location in terms of file quality, color saturation, clarity, all that stuff, right? They'll have a lot of the same tools to get there. They might have a different starting point, but you know, you as the photographer are what takes that starting point and makes it into what you want it to be at the end. So really, it doesn't matter what the starting point is. It matters what the ending point is capable of producing for you. Yeah, and Doug, like like what you were saying about the uh, you know the the camera body profiles. It, one thing that clicked while Don was talking, I have one of my I have an old Canon 10D. You remember those? Mm -hmm. so I have an old Canon 10D that I had modified for infrared. So you know the the files that come off of there are all kind of magenta looking, you know. Um, but you can set up a camera profile. So for that specific serial number, when Lightroom sees that serial number and I import files from that camera or that were written to the SD card or CF card in that case, from that camera, it automatically ap applies default raw processing to all those images. So I never see them in their ugly pink state. They come in and they automatically look you know, like they're ready for editing. So that's one, that's one way to think about it. If you set a custom uh, camera a white balance in that specific case for infrared photography, mm -hmm. uh, Lightroom and Camera Raw won't recognize it because their default white balance setting doesn't go cold enough to properly register it. Yeah. Uh, so that's why you have to create the custom camera profile. But if you were to bring it into Canon's Digital Photo Professional, it recognizes it just fine. So again, oh. there's other differences. There's a lot of different ways for you to look at it. Um, but again, find the best tools for, for your purpose. And uh, it's the end result that matters, not the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I find I find as I as I walk through the journey of life that I'm trying to simplify more and use fewer tools. Like if I could get everything done in Lightroom and maybe Photoshop, that's where I'm gonna stay. I just wanna be I just wanna go in there, get it done and be done. I don't wanna be like Don, I imagine you're like the, the mad scientist with all these apps. You're like, first I'm gonna pour the pixels into this beaker and let them put them in the centrifuge, and now I'm gonna pour them into this beaker and let them sit for a day, and you know all that. Whereas I'm like, just give me the pixels, dude. I want to get on with my life. That sums yeah. it up pretty well there. I know. I I feel the illustration of you coming on with a white lab coat on and beakers, and you know, we should do it. We do you know it. that just about anybody can buy a lab coat and look like a professional? I know, and be taken seriously. You know, exactly. if you walk around with a kind of concerned look on your face with a lab coat, you know, <laughs> and if you're Doug K with that white hair with a lab coat, you know, <laughs> well, then you got everything. <laughs> you got the whole human genome in your pocket. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, if you guys, listeners, if you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show or not answer, just visit our website at thisweekinphoto.com and click on that submit a question link and send us your question, or you can even leave us a voice message. All right, guys, uh, it's time for the picks of the week. Remember, you can recommend anything to the TWIP army as long as it is somehow related to photography. Mr. Doug K., I'm going to let you go first. What is your pick of the week? My pick this week is a book. It's a book by uh, Mary Alden, uh, Allender, and it's called Group F.64. Um, mm -hmm. The F.64 group is sort of mid-last century. It's people like Edward Weston, Ansel Adams, Imogen Cunningham, Dorothea Lang. And what um, Mary Allender did, she was, by the way, she was Ansel Adams' assistant for a while, and she knew all these people extremely well. Uh, and so this is more of a biography of these people, and she's a very good writer, and it tells the story the stories about how all these photographers interacted with one another, how they inter interacted with the East Coast, um, uh, uh, they called pictorialism. What's the phrase? I'm I'm losing my mind. But um, how they interacted with all East Coast photographers at the time. It's a really nice read. It's very entertaining, uh, and anybody who's interested in photography will get a, a lot of pleasure out of it. Very cool. And what's it What's it called again? Group, group, group sixty four. 
Very cool. Awesome. And I'm looking at, I was showing the Amazon page while you were talking there. It's yeah. only $25 and, and available through Amazon Prime. Look at 25 that. or you can get it on the Kindle. The problem with the Kindle is you don't get to see the pictures very well. And there's not a lot of photographs in it. But, um, you know, for an extra $11, you might want to get the hard copy. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's on the uh, on iBooks as well as a, I don't as know. a fully illustrated version. That would be cool. All right, well, cool. Perfect pick of the week. Thanks, Doug. Mr. Don Komarechka, what's your pick of the week? Well, I, I just got this in the mail the other day, and I haven't had a lot of time to play with it, but I've had some fun uh, sort of testing experiences, and I got it for some fun experiments that I'll have along the way. Um, so this is the box that it came in. For those that, that are um, uh, that are listening to this, what is that? In, uh, in full poop position. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so the, the company is called uh, <clears throat> uh, Dog Shit Optics. Uh, shit spelled uh, S C H I D T and optics with a K. Good, and we can keep our clean label for this episode. Yes, Very good. Exactly. Um, so now, uh, yeah, I don't mean to be profane, but that, that's, it's, it's, so what this is, this is a um, an old lens that's been reconditioned by these guys uh, to do whatever the heck you want with it. So this is an old Helios 44 uh, 58 millimeter lens called the Flare Factory 58. And so uh, for people shooting video especially, this kind of thing can be very useful because you can get uh, coatings removed, you can get grime added to the lens elements, lens separations, tints applied to it to create all sorts of interesting optical effects that might be more difficult to produce in post. One of the things that's difficult to produce in post is really good realistic flare. Um, and so by removing the anti-reflective uh, anti coatings on one of these lenses, you can get a lot of flare coming in into your shots for creative effect. Uh, now I've about this to experiment with in uh, extra spectrum photography and infrared and ultraviolet and all sorts of fun stuff. And, uh, and so I'm going to have a lot of uh, fun experimenting with that. They put a brand new camera mount on it, so this connects to my, my uh, modern uh, Canon digital SLR. They make it for Nikon uh, and uh, I think one other brand as well. Um, or they make it in the PL mount uh, for, for vi videographers. Uh, and I've got a, just a standard aperture in there. It, it's f2 wide open and then it goes to think uh, f16, but you can choose to have oval apertures, you can choose to have a particular shape as an aperture. Uh, and the optics I think are pretty pretty well. I mean for I mean it was uh, this lens was a, a knockoff of the uh, the Zeiss Biotar 58 millimeter. Uh, and so it's a pretty solid optical formula. They made these things well into the 1990s, I think. Uh, but you know, it could be as early as the 1960s, depending on uh, when they were manufactured. So uh, I've I've had a lot of fun just taking some test shots in infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, and this this lens is going to be coming around with me uh, the entire time I'm out shooting waterfalls or nature or landscapes, just to try something different and stay creative. I I want to I want to suggest that that listeners. Whatever they do, go look at the website for this company. It's really fun. When Don posted this in the show notes, I had to go check it out. And, you know, it's got things like, you know, you can you can order different colors. You can order dust and dirt in the lens, uh, different styles of dirt. You can order, you can say, how much contrast do you want? You can get it low, very low, or extremely low, I think, in what? terms of contrast. It's, it's really a fun website. And they will take the uh, the outside of the lens and uh, finish it the way that you want. I went for the brushed metal look on mine, um, but they will do like all sorts of grungy steampunk effects. You can have it matte black, yeah, any kind of finish on the outside. They will customize the old lens just to match whatever the heck you want. Uh, and I've even even seen them put like custom uh, stenciled uh, decals on the outside of uh, of the lenses too on request. So, wow, uh, they, they they do custom work for these. They're not terribly expensive considering that they're all sort of handmade or at least hand remade. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. So go check these guys out. Uh, now, if I'm if I'm I'm looking at the page now. I'm showing it in the in the window. I hope you guys can see that. But do they? Uh, so these are actual lenses then, right? So these aren't. And they're like yeah. surplus Russian lenses or something. These are beautiful. They're they're really cool looking. Like, w if I wanted to put this on a micro four thirds camera, could I do that, Don? I don't think that they have a micro four thirds mount. I think it's Canon, Nikon, and PL at the moment. But oh, uh, okay. heck, they're they're custom made, so you're hey, free no, to get, no, it, put, guys. get it. Get it for get it for Canon or Nikon, and then just use the adapter for a mirrorless. It works just fine. You yeah. can do that too. Yeah. Look at this. You, Doug, this looks like a lens that I saw you with at lunch one day. Is that didn't you have this one? No. No. Go <laughs> go, go back to that. Didn't you? Uh, scroll down. I want you to see one more. Keep going down to where they talk about um uh like contrast. Ordering your yeah, lens external finish. I was on there. That must be a different page. We could spend uh, all day. But 
Oh, here it is. Look at that. Low, lower, and stupidly low. <laughs> I love that. Look at Very the dirt. Good. Look at the dirt options. You just had it right next to the, the dirt options. I can't read those headlines, so you read them. Yeah, element separation creates additional extreme and wild, unpredictable flares. Cleaning marks contribute to further flaring artifacts like rainbow fans and grungy texture in the bokeh. Dirt, dust, and debris. Think dirty Hasselblad waist-level viewfinder with bits of crap on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. Good find, man. Look at this. Ah, I may have to uh, order. See, now I feel like shopping now. I'm going to have to go in there and... Uh, and look around uh, a little bit. For, for a, like a fun thing like that, I think it's uh, 180 pounds, uh, so you'd have to do the currency conversion, which for something as unique and handmade, that's not so expensive. Uh, it might deter some people, but really, it, it, it's a fun thing to have in your camera bag. And if you're looking for that one thing to, to get around your creative blocks, uh, I think this is it. Yeah. And, and yeah. no two of them will be alike. Yeah, it's the perfect fashionista item, you know, for the people that care more about what the camera looks like than what's coming out of the camera. It's perfect because you just like, it's a conversation starter. You put that thing on the on the table at lunch, and people are like, dude, what is that? <laughs> you got to get one. So Don, you ordered one, right? So I got I got it, and so you know, it, it it connects perfectly fine to the camera. Of course, it's all manual focus. It's a manual aperture, so I'm never really sure exactly what the aperture is set to because I'm just moving. Uh, just it's it's a completely fluid aperture that has no real markings on the outside of the lens for me to to, to reference properly. Um, so there's a certain amount of guesswork in that, and as you make the aperture smaller, of course, your viewfinder gets darker. Uh, if you're not used to using manual lenses like that, then uh, you know th this is this will be a new uh, you know something to learn from. Uh, but go out and get one. These things are fun. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to regardless. i got to get one. Cool. All right. Uh, that's it, guys. We're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Uh, Don Komarechka, what have you been working on lately? Like, what projects do you have going on that people can, uh, you know, connect with you and see where you are? Well, I, I'm so thankful that I just finished my Snowflake project. For those that haven't been following my work, it's the it's the biggest marathon that uh, that I could ever possibly undertake. Just about killed me this year, uh, producing a hundred separate uh, images. Some of them taking over eight hours to edit every single day throughout the winter time, uh, and you know nonstop one a day. And so that was uh, a gargantuan effort. And I'm glad that it's done. It was a huge success. It had tons of feedback and support for it. So thank you for all the encouragement uh, from a lot of Twip listeners as well along the way because I couldn't have done it without you. I wouldn't have had the motivation to. Um, and uh, now that I'm playing my catch-up game right now from all the projects that were on the wayside, but for anybody listening to this just about at the time that it airs, um, the weekend I think that, that this is airing, I will be at uh, the, uh, the Can-Am Photo Expo in Buffalo, New York. And so that's uh, March 20th, 21st, and 22nd. And I'm doing a number of, uh, of sessions on uh, some uh, low-light night photography, landscape stuff, and macro photography, including some fun uh, demonstrations, uh, some light and easy to understand, and some very technical stuff that uh, you can totally geek out with. So uh, if you're anywhere near Buffalo, New York, stop in and, and say hi. Awesome. Cool. And while you're at it, where can people go to connect with you online? Go to doncom.ca. Everything's linked to there. Uh, and, of course, you'll find all my latest posts and musings on uh, Google Plus and Facebook and anywhere else that I am online. It's all linked there. And on Meerkat, right? Uh, not yet, but, hey, you know what? That sounds like if I ever had a reason to do instantaneous live streaming video, that's where I would do it. <laughs> You'd start there. Awesome. Well, always a pleasure having you on, Don. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Frederick. All right. Also, Mr. D Mr. Doug K. D Doug, where can uh, people go to see what you're working on next, and what are you working on next, and where are you going, all that good stuff? Well, uh, they can go to DougK.com, K-A-Y-E, and that's the beginning. From there, they can get to everything they ever wanted to know. Um, but I, a few weeks ago, I got back from uh, another workshop I led in Cuba. I uh, went to Maui, shot the humpbacks for a few weeks. No. Uh, doing a, now that I'm back, I'm catching up on all the teaching I'm doing, uh, both privately and for the Arcanum. Yep. And uh, we just did set the dates for the next two Cuba workshops, tentatively, but uh, November 5th through the 13th and January 7th through the 15th are the next two Cuba workshops I'll be leading. And if you go to DougK.com and look for workshops, you'll be able to find links to those. Very cool. Awesome. Oh, and and all about the gear, of course. Oh yeah, what do you what do you got coming up next on all about the gear? What are you going to be? We're we're working on well, we just published the Fuji X 
X one hundred T show, and uh, working right now on the Samsung NX one, and after that, it's the Olympus uh, OMD EM five Mark two. Oh, I did not know about the Mark II. Yeah, well, I don't tell you everything. God. I, have to, I have to surprise you once in a while. Yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what There's we're a doing Mark II? The then the EM5 just going uh, No, no, I have the EM5. So this is the latest iteration to the EM5. Okay. One with the jiggly sensor, the 40 megapixel images yeah. from the jiggly sensor. Ugh, uh, uh, I hate it. I, got, I need blinders. I need photographic blinders so that I'm not tempted by the dark side of the force. Hey, if you buy me lunch, I'll let you play with it. All right. Cool. I've heard that before. It always ends badly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Guys, we are at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. I want to thank both of our sponsors for their support, and that's our friends at FreshBooks.com and at Lynda.com. And be sure to check out our website over at thisweekinphoto.com. You can subscribe to all of our shows at thisweekinphoto.com slash subscribe. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, you can check out all the new webinars that we're doing at thisweekinphoto.com slash webinars. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off.